So those will be the uh, the main uh, learning objectives for um, this lecture. So let's look a little bit into the definitions. Um, and now when we are talking reproduction, we will look into um, the human reproduction. Um, well, the definition, the basic rep definition of reproduction will be the total process by which um, organisms may produce offsprings. And in case um, of a human, uh, the humans, um, they produce a new individual. Um, the basis of conception of a child will be the uh, sexual intercourse between a man um, and a woman. So during the sexual intercourse, um, the interaction between the male and female reproductive system will end up with the process of fertilization of a female ovum by the male sperm. However, if you really look into that like this, uh, we can say nowadays that the reproduction process can take place also outside the uterus um, into and without the sexual intercourse. Um, and this is what we called assisted reproductive technology. And you probably heard the numerous times the term of in vitro fertilization and intrauterine insemination. Now, um, I was telling you about sexual and asexual uh, reproduction. Um, sexual reproduction means that an offspring is the result of two different types of cells, one, pre, uh, one coming from a male subject and one coming from a female subject that together will create a new individual. And the asexual one is typical for plants or viruses, bacteria, uh, fungi, that they can just divide themselves very, very easily. Um, and by doing that, they uh, create a new individual, a new um, cell. Uh, mammals, reptiles, uh, some plants that require pollinization they um, need male and female cells to produce an offspring. So the scope of the reproduction um, can fail into, when we are looking at the, at the reproduction, we may see a woman because she can bear children, only the woman can do that, um, will fall into one of those two states. It's either a non-pregnant state or a pregnant state. So the non-pregnant state will be the state that the majority of the life of a female will spend in. Um, so the non-pregnant state can be divided very didactically into two kind of aspects. A, a woman can be non-pregnant by choice and not by choice. Um, the non-pregnant by choice, uh, it's very simple. Uh, the woman decides that she doesn't need or doesn't excuse me, not that she doesn't need, she doesn't want to have uh, children. And um, as a result of that, she will take measures uh, to stay to maintain the non-pregnant state by taking contraceptive measures or using contraceptive measures, because not all of them will be taken, or by abstinence. Now, the non-pregnant state, not by choice, it means that the woman is not making any kind of conscious decision of not staying pregnant. And it's the result of some type of um, physiological um, states. One of them will be the fact that the woman is not uh, mature sexually. Uh, she did not reach the puberty uh, in children. Another kind of not by choice uh, situation will be the infertility that, that we see in some of uh, our patients. The fact that that a woman is partnerless. And one thing that is not present here in this table um, in, and in your book is the fact that um, she, the non-pregnant state may be associated also with the fact that she can be at menopause. Now, when we are looking into the pregnant state, um, the pregnant state becomes with the conception. Um, so, the process of reproduction starts at the conception and ends at uh, birth. Now, there is a whole range of, of emotion uh, and acceptance of pregnancy, uh, and different um, patients will accept that in um, different ways. And that's why when we are looking at pregnant as planned and unplanned, 
uh, you will see that they, that's a whole range of um, behaviors that the women may exhibit based on that.
Now let's look a little bit at the menstrual cycle and ovulation and review it a little bit. Every single menstrual cycle, you need to see it as uh, the physiological preparation of the female body for conception. And the entire process from the beginning until the end is totally regulated by hormonal levels. And they are, they start at the level of the hypothalamus. The next layer um, that will uh, control that will be the anterior pituitary gland. The next level of control will be at the level of the ovaries. And if we really look into that, we have all together uh, four stages. And those four stages in an ideal type of cycle, uh, because every single client and every single female is a little bit different, those stages ideally repeat every 28H. So when we are looking at the menstrual cycle, we always start uh, with stage one, that is the menstrual phase. And that menstrual phase starts with the first day of shedding of the endometrium. And the shedding of the endometrium is the result of um, um, drop in the levels, uh, 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 an abrupt decrease in estrogen and progesterone. And that's um, observed by the woman as what is called um, menstrual bleeding. The second phase is the second of the follicular phase or the pre-ovulation phase when the ovary and the follicle itself will prepare for the releasing of an uh, ovum, and this whole preparation uh, takes place under the influence of FSH and estrogen, follicular, uh, follicle stimulant uh, hormone. And if you look a little bit over here, you will see that we have the uh, hormones of the anterior pituitary gland, and you can see how follicular follicle stimulating will have a little bit of surge over here. But this is the cut line in the 28 days, the 14 days uh, cut line. And you can see how um, it has a little bit of surge by day 10 and kind of lowers itself and has a peak by day 14. And after that, it uh, drops back. Um, definitely the luteinizing hormone has an even um, higher peak than, um, than the FSH. But those are your um, main controlling hormones. And if you really look into what they are creating, you can see how the estrogens, the progesterone is very low. The progesterone will start to increase later, but the estrogen under the influence of the FSH will have a surge towards the uh, 14. Along with that, you can see that if body temperature is kind of constant, um, suddenly when the surge in the hormones happens by day 14, there is an increase by about one degree Celsius in uh, what's about roughly two degrees Fahrenheit in the uh, body temperature if we are measuring and mapping the temperature throughout the cycle. In addition to that, pay attention to the ovarian cycle. In the ovarian cycle, you see how the follicle is growing and growing and uh, it, uh, it's about to be uh, the, at the biggest point uh, at day 14 will release the um, ovum. Along with that, the follicular phase will create an increase of the thickness of the mucosa. The mucosa will become thicker and thicker throughout the process. Now, the stage three um, is called the ovulation phase and ovulation occurs uh, the ovum is expelled from the follicle, and again, this is triggered by the sharp raising the estrogen uh, and the uh, luteinizing hormone, and immediately is captured um, inside the fallopian tubes. Remember that fallopian tubes just sit around the ovary. They are not connected to the ovary. They are just lingering around, um, and they are kind of covering um, the ovary. Now, during the stage four, and stage three is just that this day, it's kind of um, a little bit maybe confusing because stage uh, three is just this day, day 14. Now, we are going into stage four, which is the uh, luteal phase, phase uh, when the stilia in the fallopian tube are stimulated by the high estrogen levels and they will keep moving and propelling uh, the ovum towards the, the uterus. 
and you can see how the temperature continues to stay raised despite the fact that the luteinizing hormone will drop, estrogen will start to drop too. However, the progesterone will start to increase if we are measuring it in the blood and you see that it increases and it continues to stimulate the development of the uh, uterine mucosa. And this will allow for a well um, and nicely uh, cushioned bed um, in the eventual uh, possibility that the ovum is fertilized to allow for the fertilized egg to implant and become um, um, an embryo. Now, the progesterone is the result of the what is called the corpus luteum. The uh, follicle after ovulation becomes corpus luteum. And it's called corpus luteum because it has this kind of yellowish color on the surface of the uh, uh, ovary when, when we are looking at it, um, which is big at the beginning, uh, continues to secrete progesterone, uh, involutes uh, progressively. And if by day 28, no um, process of conception exists in the um, uterine cavity, there was no product of conception, the ovum was not fertilized, then corpus luteum becomes what is called corpus albicans, which is a, an, a whitish um, um, cyst on the surface of the ovary. Both progesterone and estrogen will drop drastically, dramatically, and that will cause the, uh, the new menstruation cycle to start. So let's discuss a little bit about uh, pregnancy. So pregnancy is considered a very normal physiological process. Um, so regardless if it's planned or unplanned, um, the expected outcome uh, will be um, a fetus and at the end of it will be uh, a baby. Um, just to remind you, um, we are still having very high rates of um, teenager pregnancy um, and um, we have at least uh, half a million cases um, of uh, pregnancies in women that are between age 15 and 19 throughout the United States. Um, and I think that even uh, new numbers will be a little bit higher. So let's look how do we develop a product of conception. Um, that happens through the process of fertilization. So um, in the during the sexual intercourse, the sperm ejaculated uh, will enter the vagina. And um, if you remember, the sperm um, has an ability, has a long flagellum, a long tail that um, helps with their mobility. Um, sperm will travel through the cervix into the uterus and from there will be attracted um, towards the fallopian tubes looking for an ovum. Um, in order to end up with a product of conception, uh, we need to have an ovum that will be uh, fertilized in here the distal third of um, the fallopian tube. If the pregnancy happens sooner than that, it will not gonna result in a, um, in a normal pregnancy. It will be a tubal or a fallopian tube, an extra uterine pregnancy. If it happens inside the uterus, it will be too late for the um, ovum to become implanted uh, and become a baby. So there is a specific place where it needs to happen and it needs to be in the distal third of the fallopian tube. So once they met, uh, the sperm and the uh, ovum will be uh, enclosed in the process that is, call, is called cortical reaction. And during the cortical reaction, um, the ovum will react in a way that will repel any other, chromo any other uh, sperms and the ovum will not allow another one to penetrate and um, add any uh, new genetic material because we need uh, only 46 uh, chromosomes. As a result of the fertilization, the new cell that will have 46 chromosomes is called a zygote. Um, half of the zygote genetic materials come from the mother and half is com coming from the father, uh, from the ovum and the sperm. Now, you know that female genetically, um, they are, uh, females are X, double X, XX. So the ovums 
can carry only the X chromosome. Males are XY, and they can carry the spermat uh, the spermatozoids can carry uh, both X or Y chromosome. And this being said, it is on the father to provide the uh, baby's gender. Baby's gender is always always dependent on the father. Um, within the fallopian tube, the zygote will continue to uh, divide. And in about 30 hours later, uh, we have what is called a blastomere is dividing in two, two to four, four to eight, and so forth. By day three, usually they, the uh, zygote has um, 16 blastomeres and they enter what is called the stage of morula. It's a little bit um, bigger than just, um, it, it looks like a, a small a miniature, miniaturized um, grape. By that stage, and you can see that by day um, eight or nine, it's already in the uterine cavity and um, it becomes a blastocyst. And it, that one will float freely within the uterus for another couple of days until it founds an, um, a nice place where it can implant itself in the mucosa of the uterus. Now, the blastocyst will receive nourishment from the uh, endometrial glands of the uterus, um, will receive everything that they need, um, will implant roughly by day between day six and nine. Um, and sometimes that's uh, followed by, in some, in some females, by a little bit of bleeding, kind of a spotting thing. And a lot of um, times when that happens, um, the woman will be a little bit confused, will have that spotting for a day, will think that mm, maybe that was my period. Um, and that's how she becomes confused when, um, you know, uh, defining um, what time, um, time the, the time of, of conception. Um, now, we define the development of the baby into um, the period um, of um, developing as a zygote, uh, the implantation and um, uh, blastocyst uh, for the first uh, two weeks. After that, we have the stage of uh, embryonic period that is between week three and eight, and you can see it here in this graph. Um, that's the main time when uh, most of the essential structures um, of the uh, future individual will develop between week three and eight. And we enter into the uh, stage that is called the fetal period that develops between week nine and 38 or 40. Nowadays, we are trying to consider 40 as the, um, the end of the pregnancy. Now, uh, during this stage of embryonic period, I was telling you that most of the uh, organs, internal organs, and essential functions will be established. That's why um, uh, genetic um, um, conditions may develop uh, at this stage. And we try to prevent uh, from exposing a mother during those um, first eight weeks to uh, being exposed to any external or internal uh, teratogenic agent. And just to name a few, um, will be alcohol, tobacco, radiation, any kind of infections that a woman needs to avoid during this time. Um, the next stage that starts at week nine and continues until week 38 or um, 40, it, during this stage is called the fetal period and um, the body that was totally established and formed by day eight just grow, grows and uh, becomes um, more developed. We have a few um, issues that can be um, associated with um, the uh, reproductive concept, um, and they will fall roughly into two main uh, categories. We may have the um, category of infertility, inability to conceive, and we may have the uh, issues related to maintaining and taking to term of a pregnancy. So let's see what will be the 
definition of um, infertility. Let's start with this term. Um, and infertility is defined as the inability to conceive or to become pregnant despite having um, unprotected sex for at least one year. Um, so if we are looking into a little bit of um, data regarding infertility, about 15% of the couples um, at reproductive age in the United States uh, as long, uh, and worldwide will experience uh, infertility issue. In addition to that, up to 30% um, of the cases will have what is called um, an inefficient process of reproduction resulting in what is called a spontaneous loss or a miscarriage. Um, also, always be careful when you're um, taking the history from one of your patient and you're um, discussing it. Those issues can be extremely um, um, sensitive and um, make sure that you're always understanding if the uh, person had a miscarriage, which is uh, most of the time uh, a spontaneous loss, um, or the, per the person was telling you that they had an abortion, which is most of the time abortion is a more, it's a rougher way of expressing it. And uh, we are in a society that it's kind of sensitive about the uh, subject of abortion. So make sure that you're um, addressing it with a lot of sensitivity. Abortions are usually those that are requested uh, by the, uh, the patient or may have been um, recommended and performed because um, the doctors found um, some kind of uh, pathology with the fetus that is incompatible with life or uh, the mother's life was endangered during the pregnancy. Um, so we know that there are a few things, a few conditions are um, associated with infertility. Um, and infertility can, can come in a couple from both sides, can originate in uh, both uh, partners. It can be related to the male or the female. And um, we recognize a few of those conditions and some of them are genetic. And we know that some genetic syndromes will not gonna be able to reproduce themselves as Turner syndrome or Klinefelter syndrome. Um, there are some hormonal conditions that will affect the ability to uh, reproduce as ovarian um, factors. Um, a female uh, may suffer of what is called primary or secondary anovulation. Uh, they do not uh, release an ovum from the follicles. The follicles may develop, but they never release an ovum from the inside. And that can be primary or secondary. Primary is related to the organ itself, to the ovary. Ovary is uh, disease or secondary when um, it depends to other causes, usually hormonal. Uh, we may have um, other hormonal causes as pituitary or hypothalamic uh, hormone disorders or disorders that are related to the adrenal gland um, as congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, we may have um, um, the amenorrhea um, is a condition that shows up uh, when the um, oral contraceptive pills are discontinued. Um, a lot of times patients that have been for at least uh, five years on oral contraceptives, and now they decide that they want to go off the pill and become pregnant, it may take uh, up to a year and sometimes up to a year and a half until their menstrual cycle will be really established um, in a normal um, way. Um, and another type of hormonal condition may be the, um, the increased prolactin level. In addition to that, we have pure anatomical uh, reasons why a pregnancy cannot uh, be established. Um, may have been a pathology of the uterus, of the fallopian tube, uh, maybe any type of uh, peritoneal adhesions that contributes to infertility, the reducible mobility or inflammation with adhesions and strictures, um, maybe result of chronic um, pelvic inflammatory diseases or chronic cervicided uh, that will leave the woman with inadequate cervical mucus or with uh, stenosis of the cervix. Um, and may have, now we are going to another category, maybe physiological uh, conditions is um, anemia, obesity, thyroid disorder. Um, physiological conditions um, that may lead to infertility are also seen in those patients that are professional athletes and they are training themselves a lot that changes their hormonal balance until they do not stop being 
um, athletes and they do not lower their level of intensity of training, they will not be able to uh, become pregnant in those cases. Uh, also, um, anorexic patients uh, will be also um, not have um, any, any type of ability to conceive. Um, for males, if you're looking into um, the hormonal disorders in males may be uh, related to low testosterone levels, uh, some other endocrine disorders, um, we may have structural and anatomical uh, conditions in males also. Um, that can be testicles that are damaged by mumps, uh, by um, undescended testes, uh, any type of obstructions at the level of the epididymis as a result of recurrent or chronic inflammation of the testicles. Um, and most of them, they are related back to uh, sexually transmitted uh, infections. In some other patients, the exposure to environmental hazards is radiation of, or toxic hazards may compromise their ability to produce uh, gametes. Um, another thing that can compromise the production of gametes may be um, the exposure to high temperature, uh, nutritional deficits, obesity. Now, when we are looking and analyzing um, reasons for infertility in men, we are um, examining their sperm and we are looking for a certain degree of mobility and to the quality of the sperm. We need to see a specific type of number with a certain degree of mobility. And we want to see that those uh, sperma, uh, spermatozoa, that they are healthy, that they look nice and they are not looking like uh, little monsters and they are deformed. Um, the um, substance abuse uh, or um, alcohol, increased alcohol consumption, um, um, some medication may impair the ability of male to uh, conceive. Now, looking a little bit into the, how can we maintain a pregnancy and um, optimize the fetal, fetal growth and development, um, they, that's a multitude of uh, reproductive issues that may result in the failure to maintain a pregnancy. Um, now we are looking just at the mother. If before that, in infertility, we had both uh, sides of the couple uh, could have been affected, and sometimes it's just one, and sometimes it's both of them. When we are looking at um, the situation of maintaining the pregnancy, we have the mother only. Um, and those issues can be related to um, maternal infections as um, encountered in the first trimester, is rubella or toxoplasma, um, ectopic pregnancy, a trauma, and we have what is called spontaneous, habitual spontaneous abortion or miscarriages that will be females that have this kind of recurrent uh, event. Most of the times, the uh, spontaneous abortions are a result of uh, chromosomal abnormalities in the fetus. Uh, kind of the nature saying, well, this product of conception is not viable, is not something that can uh, exist, and um, it's kind of purging it in the process. Um, if the maintaining of the pregnancy um, can be affected by those elements in the first trimester, in the second and third, um, other condition may affect the um, maintenance of pregnancy and the development, as gestational diabetes or hypertension, preeclampsia. Infections can still affect the um, um, the fetus and the mother. Um, towards the end of the of the third trimester, um, other complications that can affect the the outcome are uh, related to um, where the placenta is positioned and if it's um, uh, properly um, implanted or not. The last aspect in the variation in context that we need to discuss is what is called the un unplanned uh, pregnancy. So um, while pregnancy um, can be expected, it's considered expected whenever a, a couple has intercourse uh, without any type of contraceptive measures, um, during the unplanned pregnancy, that can be um, consensual or non-consensual. And um, a lot of times uh, comes from the unplanned pregnancy comes um, as a result of uh, lack of education regarding uh, pregnancy and conception and can be um, associated with a lot of emotional and physical damage to uh, the female. 
So if we need to summarize, you see that those variation in the context are um, so wide um, and we really need to uh, address them and we will study them during the, um, when we'll do the lectures next week um, regarding pregnancy and we'll understand them um, uh, a little bit more in depth. So when we are talking about reproduction, we have, uh, we, we need to discuss uh, the risk factors associated with the human reproduction. Um, in most cases, this is a process that is physiological, is natural, and occurs without any incident in majority of the cases. Um, however, we can look into, into it a little bit deeper and we can find that we have what is called population at, at risk. And the first one that comes to my mind is the adolescent population. Um, and it's, it's a very high risk, um, mainly because adolescents, uh, they lack education in reproduction. Um, they may have impaired nutrition. They are still in the process of developing. They are still children by, by themselves. They are not adults. Even if their body starts to show signs that they can reproduce themselves, they are, in fact, emotionally and physically uh, still children. They may have anemia, they can easily contact infections, um, they are exposed to uh, depression um, may, and, and social isolation. Uh, they have more um, obstetric-related complications as preeclampsia or um, premature labor. Um, so all those elements um, will have a, a long-line impact um, if an adolescent becomes, um, becomes pregnant. Um, in addition to that, we have what is called impoverished population um, that will lack not only education, uh, but will lack the uh, necessary nutrition that is expected for a pregnant woman to uh, be able to provide for herself and the fetus, and they will lack the um, necessary health care uh, supervision um, and follow-up. Um, and that's when we are looking at population now. If we're looking at individual risk factors and what can we recognize and um, how can we identify those patients that will have an increased risk during their reproductive uh, years, there are a few uh, factors that we consider. And one will be uh, biophysical and um, will be those that um, we, those patients that through the history, we found out that they have um, inherited disorders. Um, in other cases, there may be those that have uh, nutritional concerns as uh, malnutrition, uh, diet, uh, inadequate or excessive weight gain. Um, we'll see um, that changes in fertility and sexual function um, occurs in male also as they grow older. Um, and if you really look into the biophysical factors related to reproduction as a couple, um, a man can father a child at any age. Um, it's not the same for the women because women are going through menopause. The psychosocial factors will include those lifestyle behaviors um, as smoking or excessive caffeine intake or alcohol consumption, drug abuse. Um, in psychosocial factors, we look also at the uh, spousal abuse and addictive lifestyles. Um, so when we are examining a patient and we are taking the history, uh, we are trying to gain elements about their well-being and uh, see how those will um, influence the development of the pregnancy. Uh, it's known that any kind of negative affective states of stress, anxiety, depression will be transferred to the fetus. The fetus is perceiving all those because there are changes in the mother's hormonal stress hormones levels, and those are perceived uh, by the fetus in uterus, and um, they will have um, negative, um, you know, influence on the uh, on the outcome. The socio-demographic factors, um, again, we are going back to what we call the impoverished population. They will have uh, inadequate prenatal care. Um, usually, they have a lot of children that um, it's a burden from an economic point of view. Um, they may be single mothers uh, a lot of times. Uh, we also for socio-demographic factors, we are looking and comparing uh, the urban ver versus rural. Usually, rural areas are underserved in terms of healthcare. 
and also race uh, or ethnicity. Um, we know as a fact by doing, by, by research and looking at the da data that exists out there that um, there is, um, if we compare um, the whites to African-American, the African-American newborns will have a higher rate to be born premature with a lower birth weight and with an increased um, infant mortality. Um, the last on the list will be the environmental factors, and those um, are referring to industrial pollution or radiation or chemical exposure. Um, in this, we can add the bacterial and viral infections or drugs. And when we are looking at the drugs, it's kind of, you can see it crosses over from the psychosocial factors here. Um, they can be over-the-counter, uh, therapeutic prescribed, uh, or illicit um, factors. And also in the environmental factors, we can add the stress factor. How do we um, assess the human reproduction? Um, so we have the element of history examination and diagnostic um, testing. And uh, as a nurse, you will be involved in all those um, elements. So in the history, uh, what is relevant about um, a female history? Well, we'll uh, look into, um, we'll inquire about uh, the woman's sexual history, including number and sex of partners, if she has any kind of contraceptive history. And when we say assessment for reproductive, um, it's because we are moving after into the um, assessment, and we are moving forward with the pregnancy and in obstetrics. However, a GYN history will be formed just by the same, we are going through the same elements. So I said uh, number of partners, se sexual history with number and sex of partners, contraceptive history, um, methods that are used previously, methods that are uh, used right now, what were the reasons for discontinuation, were any side effects of, of a medication, uh, why uh, something was changed. We look into any kind of relevant surgery. Um, did she have any kind of GYN history with removal of fibroids, neoplasm of the um, genital urinary system? Any alteration in the pelvic support, any kind of uterine displacement or prolapse, uh, cystocele, um, any kind of erectocele, the um, pap smear history, um, all the results, if they were normal, abnormal, and when and what was done for that. In the menstrual history, you will be amazed that the menstrual history is very important um, in terms of deciding um, and, and establishing kind of a pattern of hormonal um, behavior in that patient. We also need to uh, include their immunization status. Uh, we need to know all the uh, immunization that the mother had, and that's essential because the baby at birth will carry part of the um, antibodies that the mother has. So the better vaccinated the mother is, the better the uh, fetus will be in the baby um, will be uh, immediately after birth. Now we are looking into um, uh, any history of sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, and now, If those were the elements that we are looking into, especially at the, um, the beginning of the pregnancy, we can add to that the uh, pregnancy history, uh, what we call the GTPL um, uh, score. And, and we'll develop later what this GTPL thing is. Um, towards the, um, the end of the pregnancy, uh, when we see it for follow-up visits, the patient will uh, need to ask them about their uh, contraction, um, if they can feel, the, um, the the fetus um, in order, the fetal movements, um, especially after the 20 weeks of gestation. Um, before I'm going into the diagnostic test, I'm going to discuss a little bit about the examination. Um, what we look into a pregnant woman is, first of all, the vital signs need to be normal. Uh, we are not expecting a pregnant woman to be um, hypertensive. We don't expect her to have fever. We expect her to has to have a normal uh, pattern and rate of respiration and uh, pulse. They may experience discomfort, um, and this is due to a lot of changes 
that under the hormonal um, um, storm that happens during the uh, pregnancy, they may have musculoskeletal changes and a lot of discomfort and, and towards the end, even uh, pain may be expected. We expect to see weight gain and we do have normal limits of weight gain, um, especially if those that were um, under, um, uh, they have a low level of nutrition before that, those patients that are very, very, were very, very skinny. Uh, for those that uh, were overweight, we do not expect to see any weight gain. We want them to stay at the same weight or to even lose a little bit of weight. That's a normal progression of the pregnancy in uh, overweight uh, patients. So when we examine them, uh, we'll do um, an examination that includes the whole body and system. We need to do a regular head to toe type of assessment um, like we do with any other patient. Um, and we'll focus uh, a little bit more when examining the genital urinary system. Uh, and we are looking for, especially at the beginning of the pregnancy, we are looking for the softening and compression of the uh, lower uterine stick segment as the Hagar sign, um, the softening of the cervical tip as the Goodell sign, um, and that uh, violet blue coloring of the vaginal mucosa uh, by six weeks as the Chadwick sign. And those are uh, the traditional old type of um, signs that were associated with diagnostics of pregnancy back in the day when we did not have all those tests that we can do um, nowadays and we can do ultrasound even. Um, now we can have more objective elements collected about the pregnancy by uh, literally visualizing the embryo and later the fetus by uh, performing ultrasound. Um, usually we can find um, fetal heart activity by week uh, six, especially if we are doing a uh, transvaginal ultrasound. Um, and um, by week eight, we can use an external Doppler and we can auscultate to fetal heart tone. Uh, usually the um, fetal movements will be, um, they can be palpated or they can be felt by the woman by week uh, 20. Now let's look a little bit into what kind of tests we can do. Um, so we have um, imaging tests and lab testing. And um, you may have even those patients that will not gonna come um, to a doctor until the moment that they need to give birth. Um, and you will have those patients that will not gonna want to screen for any kind of genetic conditions. Our position here is to guide them. If they want the information, we can provide it. We cannot drop the information on them if, the, if it's obvious that the woman we're not going to do anything with the information or is not interesting to hear about that because that will only add to her uh, to her stress and we don't want to do that. So what will be some um, um, some diagnostic tests that, that we can do? So during the first trimester, the, the one that it's very well known and common and you know about it is the um, what we can do. It's a pregnancy test that we can do it on urine or serum. Uh, serum definitely is more um, uh, reliable and can detect the pregnancy at a very um, early stage, while urine will detect it a little bit later. We will do a complete blood count. Uh, we'll do a blood type and an RH factor is essential because if the mother has an RH uh, that is negative and the uh, fetus is positive, we will need to um, provide a certain amount of um, treatment of a medication at a certain point during the pregnancy. We will do rubella titers. We really need to know um, if we have a woman that is negative for rubella, um, well, she's an, at a higher risk, especially at the first, um, in the first trimester. And uh, rubella usually, uh, if it's contracted during the first trimester, it can have um, terrifying results on the, on the fetus. We'll do hepatitis B titers. Uh, syphilis test, and especially for the valley where we live, uh, where syphilis now it's again um, flourishing. Uh, syphilis test will be done at the beginning and sometimes before uh, the end of the pregnancy, just to make sure that the mother is still um, not um, affected by that. We'll do an HIV test. It's also essential to know about that. We'll do a urine analysis and the culture. A pap smear is needed uh, if the woman did not have one um, in the last year. 
uh, we'll check for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And uh, by ultrasound, what we can do at this stage, we do what is called the nuchal translucency. And um, whenever the translucency uh, is increased, that uh, raises is, is raising the um, um, the suspicion of some types of neurologic congenital uh, diseases of that um, embryo. Um, despite the fact that in your concepts it says that we do amnio in the first trimester, uh, please allow me to um, uh, disagree with them. Uh, what we do in first trimester is the chorionic stem cling. We don't have amnio fluid in first trimester in the amount that we can take um, and analyze for genetic uh, malformations, for genetic uh, disturbances. But what we can do, we can sample the chorionic tissue. Um, during the uh, second trimester, we will repeat the complete blood count to make sure around 26 weeks of gestation to make sure that the mother um, is not anemic as a result of pregnancy. We'll do the glucose tolerance test in the second trimester, yes, now we can do uh, the amniocentesis um, examination. Um, for third trimester, we'll do the group B strep testing um, about week 36 because we are getting closer uh, to um, delivery. And it's very important, especially for those women that want to have a vaginal delivery. Uh, we'll do again screening and diagnostic of ultrasound. And in all three trimesters, we always will evaluate and uh, will examine the emotional well-being um, of, um, of the patient. Management. So when we are talking management of the uh, reproduction, we are looking into how to prevent um, any issues and how to optimize our patient health. Um, so we are, most of the time, we will screen for eventual problems that may um, show up. So when we are talking about um, primary pre prevention, we are looking into a lot of education that we can do. Uh, and we can, first of all, educate about preventing unplanned, um, unconsent, uh, pregnancies. Uh, and that can be done and should be done um, by teaching um, in high schools um, groups of students about reproductive health. Um, the topics that can be discussed will be and should be depending on the preference um, of individuals, uh, talking about safe sex uh, behaviors or abstinence. Also, in addition to that, uh, we can teach them about um, avoidance of uh, tobacco products, about um, avoiding um, alcohol and drug use, um, about use of uh, correct contraception use, about correct nutrition. And um, if I said that at the beginning, we should start with safe, safe sex and abstinence in high school, we can start with all those teaching uh, elements in high school too, but going into groups of um, young women, those can be um, also emphasized. And in terms of nutrition, one important element is the uh, how essential the folic acid um, and especially folic acids, acid supplements um, in the first trimester are because folic acid is essential for the normal development of the nervous system of the um, embryo. Importance of exercise. Um, exercise comes all the time in all our discussions. And the how essential is uh, for um, our patients to, to reach out for prenatal care um, in terms of um, ensuring the well-being of the fetus and the mother together. In the secondary prevention screening, uh, we will look into early detection of diseases or conditions and prevention of um, their side effects. Um, what we can do in this will be to um, examine the and um, continue the assessment and the follow-up um, of the mother in terms of uh, weight gain, uh, blood pressure to prevent eclampsia. The fundal height will give information in terms of normal development of the, um, of the fetus. 
uh, we want the fundal height to be uh, high. I'm sorry. We want the fundal height to be at it, where it's supposed to be. We don't want to be smaller or higher because that will mean that there will be some complication with those uh, with that uh, embryo. Uh, we are uh, screening for edema. That's a sign of preeclampsia. We are looking for the fetal heart sounds to make sure that the well-being of the um, embryo or fetus is um, is ensured. And in terms of um, lab screening, we are looking into uh, detecting any type of uh, eventual infections uh, or or um, pregnancy associated conditions like uh, like uh, pre uh, like pregnancy associated pregnancy determined diabetes. Whenever we discuss concepts, you know that we have what is called collaborative intervention. Um, and um, we'll look into uh, what will be um, some elements that will include management and treatment of any type of pregnancy-related conditions uh, and complication. And in here, we'll include those patients that are categorized as high-risk uh, pregnancy. Um, so in, in this category of high-risk pregnancy, um, we have a combination of um, OBGYNs and what is called a perinatologist. Um, any perinatologist is um, that person that has an, an understanding of fetal development um, as well as uh, the well-being of a newborn. Um, and we are looking, again, we are going back to the risk factors that we discussed before as biophysical factors and psychosocial and environmental, and we are trying to establish if a person is at an increased risk uh, to deliver or to have complications during pregnancy. Uh, another type of collaborative intervention we see in the assistive reproductive technology, again, if you remember, we said that about 15% of the couples in US uh, may experience some type of infertility issue. A lot of those may um, decide that they will um, uh, they will go through what is called in vitro fertilization, um, and there are a few type of procedures. We can have um, a fertilized embryo, an embryo transfer uh, inside the uterus. We can have a, a gamete uh, transfer in the intrafallopian tubes. Uh, we can have zygotes transferred in fallopian tubes. Uh, we can have what is called therapeutic donor uh, insemination when there is not actually an in vitro fertilization outside the uterus, but the semen from um, a fertile semen from a donor will be inseminated inside the um, uh, patient's uterus. Now, the last uh, part of the collaborative intervention will refer to abortion. Uh, which is defined as an elective termination of the pregnancy. Um, and, and that can be done uh, in, in a few situations. Uh, when we have a woman that requests that, when we have um, genetic disorders of a fetus, uh, when the uh, product of conception is the result of incest or rape, and the last category will be preventing, preser I'm sorry, pres preserving the health of a, um, of a woman. So the most common type of abortion, which is a full blown, a full um, procedure, surgical procedure. Um, the most common one is what is called the vacuum aspiration. Uh, it can be done up to 16 weeks um, after the uh, menstrual period. So if you do the math, it, it kind of, um, Patches the the border of the first trimesters. Uh, we have also other types of um, um, abortions that can be done by what is called dilation and curettage (DNC). When the cervix will be dilated and uh, the product of conception will be eliminated, removed from the uterus by um, scraping the mucosa and cleaning the cavity, uh, the uterine cavity. Uh, you can see here that we have a few interrelated concepts. Um, it's kind of pretty self-explanatory that uh, sexuality uh, and hormonal uh, regulation are very close related to reproduction. 
uh, nutrition is essential for maintaining um, a normal reproduction uh, capability and to sustain the development of a product of conception. Uh, again, perfusion and gas exchange is also essential for production. Without the normal perfusion and gas exchange, I mean, gas exchange at the level of the lungs transported by the um, by the blood to uh, to the fetus, um, the process was not going to be possible. 